Hey guys, it's Mrs. D. I thought I would do some of these lectures um, recordable because inevitably, though we're doing the introduction for some of this literary theory technique now, some of you may not kind of find it applicable until you're done reading your books. Now you've had two reading days in class already, but some of you have longer books. So it might be that you're not finishing your reading for another week yet. Um, and I do understand that you might want to come back to the lecture, so I just thought this would be easier, although I am going to hate hearing you guys replay it in the classroom. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit to you guys about uh, the two gender critics that I'm presenting to you, uh, three I suppose if you look at the notes about Helene Sizu. So of the, the people that I've given you in a list related to queer and gender theory um, for your literary analysis papers, the three I think are serving size, introductory, kind of good baseline for you to have are Judith Butler, Laura Mulvey, and Helene Sizu. All three of them sort of notoriously um, don't purely identify as a gender critic. They would all say that they go into separate boxes as well. And Helene Sazu actually, funny enough, does not actually believe she's a gender critic. Um, if you were to ask her what she is, that wouldn't be what she says is true about herself. Uh, and I think sometimes that comes into play, although the rest of us widely call her a gender critic. I want to start with her. So I did not give you the essay for Laugh of the Medusa, which is her most famous work. If you would like it, I can get you a copy and you're welcome to it. I just thought that looking at the notes for her might be better first. Um, I'm pointing because I know I have the notes on the board. Um, the notes are going to tell you whether or not she is usable for you. Now, she's usable under some conditions. If your paper or the way you want to an analyze your paper is going to be related to sort of the line between how we write and who we are and how we express that line. Helene Sisu is pretty useful. She was uh, multilingual. She wrote, she wrote and read in several languages and she talked about l'écriture féminine. Um, so Helene Sisu was, I think, French Algerian belief. Um, and L'Ecriture Feminine talks about the way that women have to write, which Helene Sazou is saying is inherently different from how men write. Now you have to remember, she's in the early part of the 1900s. And again, some of these ideas may seem like, of course, to you guys who were born post 9-11. Like you guys were born decades after her. So at the time that she's writing this, this is a kind of brand new endeavor. Um, Helene Sazou is saying, writing has always been what we do to record speech. In other words, the way we talk about ourselves comes first and writing comes second. And therefore, writing is always kind of struggling to play catch up. Um, female texts and writing have to represent the difficult area where female speech has evolved in her mind to sort of know how to survive in a male climate so that you know how to talk to certain people in certain circumstances. It becomes a bit of social survivalism. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say social Darwinism because she would certainly take, I think, issue with social Darwinism and so would Darwin in this instance. But um, if you were feeling creative, I suppose you could draw some lines there. She would say that the way we evolve to write has to reflect speech. And speak, speech is in some ways much more flexible when you talk to people, uh, especially in the, the maskless states, right? You have facial expression, you have tone, you have hand gestures and other things that sort of indicate meaning to you um, or help you interpret what's in front of you. Whereas writing, as you guys well know, the internet generation, takes those things away. And because writing takes them away, you can sometimes misunderstand or mis miscontextualize pieces of writing. Um, she's fascinated in this. She likes Derrida. I would not recommend that high schoolers go looking into Derrida. I wouldn't recommend high college students looking into Derrida. I wouldn't recommend most people 
bashing their heads against that particular wall. There's a um, detail to Derrida that is frustrating. He's cool in certain circumstances. He is, but I think the average person would find him over-analytical, um, infuriatingly precise, and that when you get to arguments in some of those essays, it's extraordinarily nitpicky. And if that appeals to you, you'll love him. But if you're frustrated by why are we having seven pages about like how a comma splice works, then you will not like him. So she's a little bit like that in that she takes a lot of sort of interest in the specifics of how things are presented. Now, the way she's doing that has a lot to do with colonialism. So she would kind of more say that she's interested in representing female voices from colonized places. So Helene Sisu um, would probably more classify herself as post-colonial than feminist. It does play heavily into her works, but also she talks so much about the experience of being female. Um, she really questioned gender binary. She didn't understand why it was sort of seen as male voice as truth and female voice as um, argumentative against this. Like, why do females have to be posited in the terms of argument? Now you, again, my all-male class in my, my new generation of people, you may not quite understand her point there is totally valid. And I would encourage you, my males, um, to any time you see, especially earlier gender critics, saying this is what's true about women, to try and see if it applies to a concept like toxic masculinity. Do you see the ways in which she is talking about men relevant to you? Or are some of the things she's ascribing to the female condition actually more relevant to you guys who exist in a very different gender schema than she did, right? I would say that it is widely true that your generation is being raised among a greater, I don't know, understanding and unification of different gender strata. So she's definitely in a more rigid condition. Um, and see what you can glean from it. See if any of the ways in which she phrases struggle apply to you or to what you're reading. Don't dismiss female critics writing about feminism as being inherently unapplicable to men, especially because when they're writing in different times, what they are writing about, which is a gender and how it is being uh, sort of used, misused, or misrepresented in a larger condition, a larger world. If you take out the word female, it may very well apply to you guys, or it may very well apply to your books. Um, consider whether or not you can use the ideology if you change the phrasing. That's fair game for analysis. Um, so with Sisu, I gave you the notes, and if you're intrigued by them, they're attached to Google Classroom, you can ask to read Laugh of the Medusa. It's not a bad piece at all. Um, now you have two essays. I have given you Judith Butler and Laura Mulvey, both of whom I like very much. Judith Butler, this comes from a chapter of her book called um, Gender Trouble. So Judith Butler is a third wave feminist critic. Laura Mulvey's a little earlier, she's still second wave. Um, she continues writing into the third. Some, someone might take issue with me online for saying that she's purely second wave. Um, and Judith Butler certainly was raised among the ideology of the second wave, but she becomes a third wave influencer. So um, as with many things, the lines with which we are raised are kind of fluid, right? Like we're all raised in different times, different things influence us. But to be kind of general and sweeping, Judith Butler to me is one of the most formative modern gender critics and I think a lot of what she says is what has shaped how you guys were raised. Um, Judith Butler says you have to stop looking at sex and gender as assigned roles that we are given and we have to accept that they are performances we put on. She means this literally. She uh, at one point will define gender as the thing that you do every day. So what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? It's the way you do it every day. Now what's intriguing about that is sometimes when people take the trouble to define what it means to be a man or a woman or fill in the blank, 
they become very like this is what it means and anything else doesn't count so it becomes exclusionary if you don't do this you're not part of the club and this inevitably leads to infighting and arguing butler would say a performance you have to kind of really use that as a a literal term if you get up every day and generally speaking you do these behaviors the collective performance over time defines what it means for your gender. So how do you define being a man? It's what you do most of the time. There's going to be days where you don't, right? There's going to be exceptions to the rule, and I like that a lot about her theory. Um, her theory essentially says you could uh, to be very simpli like simplifying on it, you could think that women have to wear dresses and get up every day and wear a dress except for like that one Tuesday last week where you wore overalls. And she's like, no, widely you're still performing the other behavior. So widely that's true for how you see and perform gender. In other words, what you do happens. And then later we reflect and label. It's a, as opposed to labeling and then filling the performance up with that, like as opposed to saying you will be a boy and therefore you will behave the way I'm saying boys behave. Um, it's the order of events that's interesting with her. Is she, she almost says like kind of free yourself from putting the label first. The label should come later upon reflection and you should really look at collective behavior. Um, she would obviously separate biological sex from gender, social construct. So when she's looking at social construct, she would also therefore say that it seems to be that these behaviors group in certain individuals or certain um, areas. It, this can be very regional, the way that you see gender performed in certain neighborhoods might be different than other neighborhoods. I like that she gives people a chance to self-assign so that you can reflect on your own behavior. Now, Judith Butler's very political, so this is not necessarily designed and written in the essay to be applied to writing. Um, so when you guys read, you would do something like, well, in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, we see Nurse Ratchet doing this, that, and the other thing repeatedly. So even though she says, this is what she believes it means to be a woman. She does A, B, C, and D. And because she does A, B, C, and D over and over again, that's the performance of gender to her. And you can always take the reading of a character and juxtapose it against additional material. So like they've done a Nurse Ratchet show, you are welcome to compare how the two portrayals of Nurse Ratchet line up. You are welcome to compare the Kubrick Nurse Ratchet to the novel Nurse Ratchet to the Netflix Nurse Ratchet, if you are so inclined to do so. Not to shout out my one flew over the cuckoo's nest reader. You could also apply this, of course, to the male characters. Never think that I'm only identifying female characters with it. You can apply it to anybody. Um, I wrote a paper once looking at Richard II and uh, his cousin who became Henry IV and then his son Henry V, and I, I essentially said the way they each performed the role of king was inherently different, and one of them was more successful than the others. Um, that it became learning what not to do by watching other people and realizing that even though they were performing the role, they weren't doing so very well. Butler allows for human error. She allows for us to think we're performing the way we need to and maybe we shouldn't be doing it that way. Um, I, I like the sort of practicality of Judith Butler. She's wordy and she's really well educated and loves to show that off. Um, so she can be sometimes uh, not boring to read, but like you can sometimes get caught in going, I haven't read those seven other critics she's referencing. This is awful. And you don't necessarily need to read them. You're there to read what she thinks about them. So does she think they're right or wrong? What did she summarize their point as? And it might not be relevant to how you're using her. So don't get frustrated by that. Be pragmatic. I'm not asking you to use every line of Judith Butler in your literary analysis. You can cherry pick and pick the pieces of her that are most applicable to you. And the other parts that you don't need, you don't have to worry about. 
um, good literary analysis in the final paper wants to see what is most applicable to you. The part that you're doing now, which is the reading part, this is where you read and bash your head against the, the essays and see if they work for you. This is the part where you struggle with what is she even saying and how much of it is useful. Later when you write the paper, you don't need to prove that you read every single second of it because you're only going to be using the parts that are applicable to your argument. Um, I like reminding you guys of that or else you get nervous that you haven't shown off enough. But you're going to be showing me the annotations, you're going to be talking about these, so I'm not concerned about you using your essay as the form to prove reading on these. We're doing that a different way. So last but not least, Laura Mulvey, who I think might be my favorite of the bunch. Um, I like Mulvey because I find I apply her idea of the eye and the gaze to a lot of things. Um, it's how my mental construct of writing works. When I write and when I read, movies play in my head. So when she talks about film theory, to me there's no line between film theory and reading and writing because that's how it looks in my head. Like I'm not... I don't see pages and words in my head, I see images. So I don't understand where the line would be between that and a camera, except that a camera records it for other people. And this one sort of lives exclusively in my head. So that's why I like her so much. The way she describes how things are framed, how things are presented, makes a whole lot of sense to me with the way I read. And I think that's why she's my favorite. If you guys read that way, I encourage you to maybe think about it that way. If that's not how you read, maybe she makes less sense to you unless you're looking at film. But funny enough, my crafty boys, um, of all of you, I think all of you chose books that have relevant film. We have uh, V for Vendetta, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, The Hobbit. I mean, that's, that's a lot of film. And a lot of you have talked about looking at the films for your books, regardless of whether or not you thought you would write about the film. So I think having a film critic here is useful because so many of you love to binge your shows and your, your movies. You love to do that over the weekend. And this might help you decide whether or not you can really use her in the right way um, to make your papers better. So Mulvey is a feminist, but she's also um, a Freudian scholar. So she's psychoanalytical. When she's using psychoanalysis, it's usually in sort of direct response to Freud. Um, we have discredited Freud as a, a psychologist. Like, people aren't like the way that Freud understands psychology is the way we do things now. But we use him in a lot of, like, the literary theorists took him when the scientists discarded him. We, we claimed him as our own because a lot of what he said weirdly feels applicable to art. So, phallocentrism. Are these works designed to sort of um, center around and celebrate the phallus? Um, are these uh, stories that men write, are these characters oddly designed after their mothers? Um, is there sort of a weird, the woman in the story must either be a mother or a whore? Like there's only two speeds, it's either sex or mommy. And, and Freud kind of led that charge and there is a lot of writing where it's interesting to apply it to. Mulvey looks at Hitchcock, our old friend Alfred. I showed you guys Rope. Um, you saw most of it. I don't believe you saw the final, the final act of Rope. Um, and we talked a lot about how Rope was designed by Hitchcock to develop the right tone. Uh, we used it to really talk about building tension. Um, that the, the tension of Hitchcock is that he shows you the murder in the first few seconds. The first few, I mean, I think it's a minute in that someone's dead. Then they hide the body, and the tension is the fact that you know the body's there the whole time. And you're just waiting for this all to go wrong. Like, it's hard to keep people on the hook like that, to keep the story progressing while that little thing stays the same. It's, it's incredibly hard to do. And he does it well. So I showed it to you as an example of how to frame your narratives and stuff, um, how to present drama. This was when you guys were writing your expositories and you were doing nonfiction writing and, and you're like, well, how do I present the order of events? Look at our man Hitchcock because he's really good at figuring out when to present certain plot points. 
So Lauren Mulvey also likes Hitchcock. And because you guys got a little exposure to him, our essay should make more sense to you. It used to be confusing to students because um, they haven't seen Hitchcock, like, socially. You guys don't watch those movies on the weekends anymore. Um, they're older now. Um, yeah, I, don't know. I watched him on the, my dad was a Hitchcock fan, so we like, used to watch a lot of Hitchcock. She talks about how he frames his women, how he chooses his actresses, what the camera forces you to look at. And like I said, in, in my way of understanding reading and writing, when I picture what a story is writing, it looks like a movie frame. So that if the author is describing a female character, it's sometimes if the concentrated like description, like say it's long, to me that's like a zoom in, we're getting close to her. Um, and that's how it looks in my head, so I apply a lot of this to reading. When you're looking at her, she's talking about gaze. So gaze, you're sitting in the movie theater and you're looking out at the movie and your eye is looking and the camera is looking and the camera knows that you're watching whatever it makes you watch and it is therefore an eye and it is gazing at whatever it is looking at. She talks about how it feels good to watch things. Part of the reason we like movies is we love to be voyeuristic. We, we love to spy on other people's problems. Hitchcock plays with this concept too. He made a whole movie called Rear Window where someone is spying on his neighbors because he has a broken leg. Um, she talks about the idea that we like to watch certain things because we're not gonna do those things ourselves so we kind of like seeing it in a simplistic way. Um, if you see two people arguing, like in, a, in the lunchroom, it's not that you would do that necessarily. You might not think to yourself, this is the right behavior. You might, you might be embarrassed if someone started doing it with you. But they're doing it, and oh, Nelly. Ooh, that's kind of fun to watch. Even if we don't think it's appropriate, we watch. We watch, and it kind of feels good to know they're doing the wrong thing. It kind of makes us feel good about ourselves because we're doing the right thing, and they're doing the wrong thing. And like, oh my goodness, that shameful thing they're doing let's keep watching. Reality TV really like found that bit of the human psyche and just like mm, mainlined it. We love to watch ridiculous behaviors that we would not otherwise do and we love to judge those people. She talks a lot about this in a way that predates all of that reality ex TV experience by decades. So I like that she predicts a lot of this stuff without meaning to. Like, she has no way of knowing where it's going to go. Her, her concern is more for equalizing the playing field. Like, how do, we, how do we give women the ability to express their own stories if the camera always seems to be a man's eye? Like, how do we give it over to someone else? Um, so as you're looking through it, she does a really lovely job just on the page. This is probably the easiest essay to read. Um, because she gives an intro with some summary material. She clearly labels each section, and then there's a summary at the end. Um, Butler, less so. Um, mm, uh, you know, Butler, it, this is meant to be a chapter in a book, so she doesn't further break that chapter down so much. If she's making a major shift, she does it. Like if she's introducing a new topic, she does, but typically that's where the chapter breaks were. So it's just because Laura Mulvey's article was designed as an article, as an essay, as opposed to Butler's, which is more designed to, to sit in larger work, Mulvey's can be easier in one sitting. Um, so my gentlemen, in case you have come back to this lecture, um, I would like to see you guys choosing one of the literary schools of thought, and several of them will be presented to you throughout the time here. Um, you don't have to use all of them. You may combine them. You can combine post-colonialism and gender. You can combine Marxism and Darwinism. Ooh, ooh that would be fun. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. You just have to find the one that kind of to be corny, the one that speaks to you. Because the one that speaks to you is going to be the one that makes the work feel easier, even though it's the same amount of work. So boys, have a great time, and I will see you on the flip side.